Welcome to More on Machines. My name is Maria Jeanson, and I'm the Strategy Manager at Imperial Tech Foresight. I will be your host this afternoon. We have an exciting event ahead of us, and I welcome those who have joined already this Zoom meeting. Uh, this is the second of a series of three sessions exploring the theme of intentional creations. It's a virtual conference where we will look at how we can reframe technology and scientific breakthrough for good and create a course for positive technological futures. As Imperial College London, this is very close to our hearts as we constantly work towards applying scientific discovery for the benefit of society. In these sessions, uh, we will explore the future through the lens of cutting edge research insights from world leading academics across the college. The virtual conference um, started last week with the theme of meta motivations, is continuing today with the theme of moral machines, and then will continue next week with the theme of malleable matter. It is a very broad theme and we're looking to cover areas such as new material prosthetics, building frugal sensing technology, ethic, ethics in organizations to material resilience. And we will run these Thursdays to inspire you and others to think differently about the future. The event is brought to you by Imperial Business Partners, a bespoke executive platform for global industry clients who want to have an accelerated access to the Imperial College London and our visionary ecosystem of startups and academics. As a platform, it gives us clients a unique approach to problem solving for research driven industries, creating access to leading expertise, talent and facilities, as well as insights like today. But for the topic of today, it's all about moral machines. And in the session, we will explore technology and ethics, uh, what is happening now and what we don't want to happen in the future. Our academics will share their research on new interventions, algorithms and frameworks that may allow us to be more connected yet mitigate against some of those technological risks to privacy and ethics. These are important questions for now, as technology is interweaving itself further into our lives, such as even accessing the conference today. Misinformation is still at large globally. Facial recognition has notably been pulled back uh, from many key players this week. Ethics, technology, and new frameworks are needed to look for as we work towards mitigating against unintended consequences. Today, we will explore this and answer the question on what interventions and design principles we might want to put in place for a more secure and human future. So enough of me. I want to introduce you to the first speaker of the day. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Rafa Calvo. He is the chair in engineering design at the Dyson School of Design Engineering. He has published three books and over 200 papers on computational intelligence and its application to health and education. He is currently the co-leader for Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence, and today he will share his research and insight on learning from sustainability to create human impact assessment frameworks for emerging technology and AI. I would now like to pass you on to the recorded video from Professor Rafael Calvo, but remember he is here live to answer questions after the recording. Most people listening to this talk on a computer or smartphone will agree that designers and engineers have an outsized impact on our daily lives. And it's not just your digital devices. The products we buy, the services we use, the things we eat, how they get to us and how we dispose of them, these are all shaped by innovation in engineering and design. As someone who combines design and engineering and who teaches others how to do the same, I'm especially concerned about understanding the impact we have on human lives and society. Since I believe that our greatest existential risk is climate change, I believe this impact needs to be sustainable. I also believe we should be designing technologies in ways that support psychological well-being. Doing so is a matter of professional ethics. What is ethical engineering? Well, the answer to this question has changed over time. As you might imagine, it has been influenced by changing values. 
For example, in the 18th and 19th centuries, engineers drove the first industrial revolution. This included exciting new materials, brand new forms of energy, and new technologies to increase productivity. These were the factories, steam engines, and trains, rushing industry and people's lives into new frontiers. England was at the heart of this industrial revolution, taking the reins with deep Victorian values. At the cusp of this revolution, Prince Albert organized the Great Exhibition of 1851, a crystal palace, an engineer wonder constructed entirely of glass and iron that rose from the ground as if by industrial magic. Visitors came from all over the world, including Charles Dickens, Lewis Carroll, Charles Darwin, to experience the industrial miracle. It was such a success that its revenues funded Albertopolis. Today, Albertopolis is known as Exhibition Road, pictured here in modern-day London. The vision for Albertopolis was to celebrate and drive the advancement of industry in the UK. Today, it is the home of Imperial College London, the Royal College of Arts, and the Victorian Albert Museum world-leading institutions in design and engineering. But there's more to this story. If we take a closer look, we find there are also impacts on humans and society that aren't quite so worthy of celebration. There are children working in these factories. Workers are exploited, living crowded and sanitary conditions and disease is rampant. The air fills with smoke and the water with waste. Here in London in 1858, we see death himself rowing through a toxic river Thames. What values were driving a technological progress that could overlook such massive costs? And could things have been done differently? During this industrial revolution, our values were centered on improving the economy, expanding commerce and building empire. This meant productivity and speed were the heroes of the day. Engineers were expected to target this. The steam engines, electricity, trains, planes and cars that we created required that we take natural resources from the land including water and air, and use them to feed into the economy. In addition to the consumption of resources, our products also produce waste when we make them, use them, and dispose of them. Although the impacts on humans and the environment were already evident in the 19th century, it took decades, decades, before changes were made. One way to address this is to minimize the flow of resources from and to the natural environment. This is what we call the circular economy. Waste gets fed back into industry. This is a change in thinking from a framework in which we rely on infinite depletion and pollution of what are actually finite resources to a new framework where the ideal innovation creates no waste it can't reuse. This reflects a change in values. Today, environmental impact assessments and sustainable engineering practices are changing every industry. In fact, environmental sustainability is a requirement for every industry. But as we improve technologies so they support our natural environment, what else has happened? Big data, small data, the data about our lives and our behaviors is so lucrative that is now often called the new oil. This makes companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon the new oil companies. But there's a significant change in the way we envision society, technology, and the economy. For many of today's technologies, satisfying a human need 
is not the end goal, but only a means to an end. Facebook doesn't provide free social networking services to help the world connect. It does so to make a revenue. Meeting a human need for connectivity is only valuable in so far as it produces profit. And that profit comes from the data it generates and the attention it extracts and sells to advertisers. From a business perspective, Facebook's goal is to keep you paying, paying attention and sharing data. Even those tools designed for work, like email, produce human impacts that can be overlooked in the race for commercial gain. And we have seen what happens when we do not consider the impact of resource depletion and discarding waste. When humans are used as a resource, the impacts can be felt by each of us every day. We deplete humans of attention to engage with others, to enjoy nature, to exercise, or do the things that in the longer term matter to them. The activities that support long-term well-being. Of course, there are differences between design and policy that supports a sustainable environment and one that supports the respect for human nature. Environmental sustainability deals with products like factories and bridges that are slow or static once installed. They have smaller scale impact and are localized to the place where they are built. The impact can be anticipated. <clears throat> And there's a long history of measuring this impact. But mainly, nature is the resource. On the other hand, measuring the impact of technology when it uses humans as a resource is very different. The technologies are intelligent. They self-learn and are fast changer. They're unbounded. Something produced in London can change the life of people in Argentina. They require continuous monitoring. Measuring the impact is, is a new thing. AI studies, AI ethics studies are now all the rage. And again, the most important change is that humans are the resource. We are means to an end, not the end in itself. Technology innovation is influenced by the social values of the time. And today, we are at a crossroads. Do we move forward towards a world where we fully recognize the impact of technology and demand that it follows our values? Or do we give up, submit to technological drivers, pretend that we cannot change them, and just hope that they will make the world a better place? Investors, governments, and many organizations are panting for the former, for driving change that puts the UK industry at the forefront of responsible innovation. Companies are seeking new ways to align their innovations with social values, like Digital Catapult, the Turing Institute, and the Lovelace Institute are some of the organizations driving this change. As we create technologies that promise to improve people's lives, their health and well-being, engineers need to make similar ethical commitments to those health professionals have with their patients. These include supporting well-being, making sure they do not harm, supporting human autonomy, be fair and just. Imagine what happens when doctors, hospitals or others involved with your health are motivated only by profit. When you don't have an NHS, you need to be very careful about the way that business models affect the health of nations. That is why we now have a biomedical ethics framework that all in the industry must abide to. That is why we also have strong regulatory frameworks that limit how products are designed, manufactured, and commercialized. Now we need similar ethical frameworks for technology. In my lab, we have been developing theoretical models that better 
help us better understand how technologies can support well-being. How, for example, a health technology can be more engaging. How it can allow users to easily personalize the interface or feel autonomous by setting their own goals. Or they, that it provides means to build meaningful relationships with others. We have also been building the empirical evidence of what works and what doesn't. For example, our Headgear app was developed to help employees in male-dominated workplaces. Through a very large randomized control trial, the best way to assess the impact, we were able to show its efficacy in preventing depression and anxiety in workplaces. This has the obvious benefit to employees, right? but also to employers because mental health is one of the biggest causes of illness and absenteeism. So where do I see our relationship with technology in 2040? Well, I also back the horses of responsible innovation. I'm an optimist. In 2040, technologies will support our well-being. They will be tested to make sure they cause no harm. And so they support our sense of autonomy, not controlling us towards someone else's intended behaviors. Technologies will be making the world a fairer place. So how is the world going to be different when this happens? Well, technology that aligns with social values and that acknowledges the impact it has on society will take us to the places we as a society want to go. If you're an engineer, a designer or entrepreneur, take the lead. Show your employees and your customers how you're ahead of the game, how you're willing to hear and adapt to the new ethics that puts them and society above all else. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. It was a very insightful talk. Um, and it was interesting to hear how you proposed to include uh, well-being focus rather than just uh, some of the more functional sides of uh, ethics and privacy, something that sometimes is deprioritized. So I have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience ahead of this event, and I think I'll, I'll start with one of them. So the first one is, is there a risk that technology change is quicker than policy and regulation? meaning that we won't be able to address new technological issues before it's too late? And what can we do to stay ahead and rigorously assess these technologies to mitigate against unintended consequences? Yes, thank you. I, I do think that that's a big risk. It's mm. a big risk that all governments around the world are dealing with. Um, on the positive side, we do have experiences, for example, with the pharmaceutical industry who, that is very innovative. You know, the pharmaceutical industry has evolved over the last 50, 100 years and follows a very, very strict protocols. Um, so, of course, we are not used to doing that in, in technologies, uh, but maybe we do require kind of a mindset change. Uh, we need to be looking more broadly uh, at these problems. Um, and we have to acknowledge also that certain disciplines like sociology have been looking at, at these uh, type of issues for some time. And policymakers, the UK is at the forefront of looking at, at the impact of technology on society. Uh, and these two groups, so sociologists, policymakers, uh, are already doing a lot of work. And the issues we have is how to bring these to engineering practice. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, I, I do think that w we can create regulations that don't limit innovation, where companies can still go and create new products, but then there is a new, uh, th there's an oversight. Um, we could, for example, be looking at uh, procurement processes. That's a very common approach that the Canadian government is using. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a question that has come in now um, that asks, since engineers, designers, innovators are often too close in their professional pressure and bubbles, how can we get ethical engineering practices into these professionals' attention without relying on proactiveness and the shift in priorities for its employers to quickly turn words into action? And then he said, obrigado as well, <laughs> which is uh, quite lovely. Uh, yeah, yeah question uh, and is one that I ask myself very often. Uh, I think there's uh, a very now in the set of we compass uh, other disciplines have uh, new perspectives that are around, uh, broad the picture of impact that we have on society. Uh, design engineering, it's a discipline that has that exact perspective. So before coming to Imperial, uh, I was a professor in software engineering, but I find now that design engineering is a perfect framework where students learn to look at all these different perspectives from understanding uh, psychological impact on users to the design processes uh, that designers uh, can use to actual engineering, including data science uh, and so on. And then we had another question coming in said, technology goes across cultures. So how can innovators adapt to differences between nations and cultures all over the world? So different companies are doing this in different ways. Amazon, for example, uh, sells in every country and they look at certain aspects that are common to mm -hmm. uh, worldwide. And there are certain aspects that are customized to the specific culture of a country. So you might have that in Japan, the logistics system is very different to the one that is used in the UK or the US. And that's because the, the way that people in Japan are used to uh, receiving packages or um, dealing with uh, the, um, customs and the post office and so on. So there are many different adjustments that companies have to do with the functional aspects of each culture. Of mm. course, there's also significant differences in the non-functional aspects of each culture that will have to do with uh, the way we relate to governments or the, the expectations that we might have about privacy. In some countries, those um, expectations change. Um, but companies are doing it already, and especially the successful companies are doing it very well. That doesn't mean that they take into account necessarily the, the values, but they do take into account the, the functional aspect. So do you then propose that there is a overall ethics model and then there are the kind of cultural nuances be below that as well? Or how would that work? Yes. So once you have certain um, basic ideas that are, I believe, common to human rights are can be understood worldwide. You can use them that I said to each particular culture. So for example, evidence shows that uh, people seek a sense of autonomy, of being in control of their own lives all around the world. Doesn't matter if it's Asia if, uh, or the West, or if it's uh, a young person or an old person, doesn't matter the race, they want to feel that they're in control of their behavior. That's mm -hmm. what it's called autonomy in psychology. So uh, platforms that support the sense of autonomy will be respecting the values of anyone in, it, in any country. Pa platforms that control people have the opposite effect. So uh, in that way, I think that a universal perspective about what of, of human nature I mm -hmm. think it's very useful. Of course, there are th certain things that are relative to each culture, uh, but um, because of, for the sake of relativism, we shouldn't um, throw um, you know, everything else. Yeah. So I think we, we've got one quiet, um, interesting question that has come through from Stephen Cassidy at BT Research, who asks, how do we quantify well-being or societal impact in this new model? 
and the historical environmental impacts from industry are much more easily quantifiable. How can we give the new model equal weight? There is actually a lot of research in the space of well-being. So economists around the world, in the UK, in Europe, uh, have been measuring well-being and applying that to policy making for some time. The UK was at the forefront of this uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so different disciplines measure well-being in different ways, but they are all relatively well correlated. So economists use uh, what is called subjective well-being measures, mm -hmm. uh, and they have big cohorts, samples of people, and they can go and ask um, what are they uh, about their quality of life, how they're doing, how they expect to be doing in the next few months. Um, and actually those variables are excellent for predicting the impact of different interventions. Uh, I remember reading an article a few years ago where Brexit could be, or the intentions to vote for Brexit were more predicted, better predicted by well-being measures than by things related to employment and so on. So they were, they had really uh, interesting uh, variables um, that can be predicted with these measures. Fantastic. And are you working on a quantifiable model at the moment? <laughs> So as a design engineer, I always work with experts in a specific um, disciplines like mental health. So when you're working with a mental health professional, the measures are things like PHQ-9, that is a measure of depression and anxiety that is quite standard. Again, uh, these measures are so reliable that if you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed with depression or anxiety based in one of these measures, you are going to get treatment your insurance is going to pay. Insurance companies don't like to pay unless they are very convinced uh, that that measure is reliable. And according to the clinical model, not being ill is the mm. same as being well. Of course, other measures like the ones economists use are very different, but economists use those measures to understand better the impact of their policies. And instead of using GDP, how much money we make, they're trying to move into measures that have to do with what the impact of that policy is on our well-being rather than on our wallets. So this can go beyond changing the technology, the product, actually changing how we look at economy today. Totally. I, I believe technologies mediate all our experiences. Mm. Using Zoom here changes our perception about how we relate to people. Now, in the last three months, we have learned that we can build connections with other people through Zoom. Obviously, there are pros and cons, mm. but we can still maintain certain uh, connections to our workplaces that before maybe we didn't expect to. We can do th that through this sort of platform. I can be talking to over 100 people right now and maybe spread all over the world. And it's thanks to that technology. But this technology mediates people's experiences and that means they might be seeing me in a particular way because the screen is not working well, or they might be uh, interpreting the medium uh, rather than the message. Sometimes philosophers say that two things come together, but um, I think the medium presents uh, the way we see the world. Fantastic. So let's take one more uh, question from the audience who said, uh, Kenny said, do we see regulators overseeing ethics? If so, would it be a central body or would it be embedded in existing set of regulators? Interested in your perspective. I, I do think that we, we should try to reuse the systems that already exist. Mm -hmm. um, the UK has uh, organizations like Ofcom and now has other ones that has been created around data ethics. Uh, the, um, and those institutions could inform the way regulation is done. Uh, I'm not an expert on policy making, so uh, I wouldn't say which is the right organization in the UK. And mm -hmm. I'm confident that that would be very different in other countries. Uh, but in exactly 50 years ago, the, the US created the Environmental Protection Agency. And that regulation then influenced uh, countries all over the world on how they regulated 
um, their own sustainability impact assessments. Um, I think uh, we are in a good position, uh, the UK today, to, to start taking that role. Uh, definitely Europe is trying to do that, to try to find ways in which they could uh, regulate the system. And that sometimes is not necessarily regulated by giving indications or guidance or set up procurement processes that uh, make the industry go in, in one particular direction. So it's sometimes about creating the right drivers, motivational drivers for companies and designers to start focusing on new perspectives that maybe before they did not think about. Um, so I'm not sure which is the right organization to do that in the UK. That will change uh, in different countries. It might be a new one or it might be one that already exists. Ofcom does a fantastic work, for example, on tracking the impact of technology on youth and people of different ages. Maybe um, an extension of Ofcom would be the right one. Fantastic. And I think we'll do one last question before we end the Q&A. So this is more an actionable question. So if I as an organization would want to start using the Hyatt approach, would this mean starting technology ethics department similar to what's happened in sustainability? How would it look like and what type of talent would, would we need to have inside organizations? So it depends on the size of your organization. Uh, large organizations are already doing that. They have their own uh, ethics person or group. Sometimes they hire external consultants. Uh, startups uh, can benefit from organizations like the um, um, Digital Catapult. In, in the UK, Digital Catapult offers uh, services to startups uh, and they look and they, one of the services they offer is a machine learning ethics committee of which I'm part of, I should um, mention. Uh, and these companies can get advice for free on what are the, the most responsible approaches to designing the technologies, the AI, AI algorithms and data collection mechanisms, what to do with the data, and what not to do, uh, and so forth. So there are systems already in place for organizations who cannot pay or don't have the scale to have their own systems. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rafa. I know that we didn't have a chance to answer all the questions, so we will be sending some to Rafa to answer after the conference. Audience, please remember to continue to send in questions uh, during the rest of, um, of the session today, as we'll have a chance to answer some as well during the roundtable discussion. So emissions that we can functionally see or monitor is one thing, but what about the data trails that leak out our inv information invisibly? Our next speaker has explored how data can be exposed from our IoT devices. Dr. Anna Maria Mandelari is a research associate at the Dyson School of Design and Engineering. In her work, she explores what we are invisibly trading in exchange for these devices. In her recorded talk, she will share examples of privacy leakage from the most popular IoT devices in the market, what the implications for consumers might be, as well as share her vision of both a positive and a negative future. Remember to ask questions as she's live here today. And now on to the recorded talk by Anna Maria. We know that any object nowadays can be connected to the internet. From smart speakers to cameras, even your fridge can be connected to the internet. We call these Internet of Things devices. And they're great. We can ask them to shop for us. Think about Alexa. They can help our kids with their homework without us knowing. They play music for us. Today, these systems are even more in demand due to the love touch experience of them. But why they are so cheap? And what is the real value they give back to us. This is where my research journey started. I wanted to know what we are invisible trading in exchange for these devices. In this context, we need to talk about three things. Privacy against gaming, how IoT devices expose privacy in a smart home, and most importantly, what might this mean for the future? 
So what we are exchanging privacy for gamings and minor conveniences? Let me tell you something. We are in danger of golf moving from buying a product to become a product. The real question is, will consumers in the future choose to trade privacy for price? The reason of my research is that the main problem is that these devices are like a black hole. They can by definition access the internet and therefore may expose private information. There is also a lack of understanding of what information the IoT devices expose, when they expose it and to whom. There is a lack of understanding of regional differences in regulations. For example, GDPR. We have GDPR here in Europe, but it's not available overseas. It's time to act and quickly. So let's have a look in depth on how those devices violate our privacy. Let's see first what is the destination of the IoT devices, what information is sent, and if they do something, that we do not expect. So we wanted to do this fully and we located the devices to the basement of Dyson building. We bought 123 different devices from appliance to smart cameras to smart hubs and other home automation devices from the most expensive to the cheapest one. And we located them in two different countries, US and UK. And we started testing them to see if we could answer these questions, these questions that we, we had on the devices. We captured all the traffic these devices are exchanging over the internet. We also built a mini test band just for testing smart speakers, for understanding how, when and why smart speakers are unexpectedly recording audio from their environment. We call this activation. Our experiments use 125 hours of Netflix content from a variety of themes and we repeat the test multiple times to understand which non-wake words constantly lead to activations and voice recording. We are also interested in whether there are trends based on certain non-wake words, uh, type of conversation, location and other factors. Let's see the first results. Most of the traffic from the UK lab is going to US or China. This is important because most traffic is beyond Europe. The traffic from many categories of IoT devices is sent outside the testbed's privacy jurisdiction. We found other privacy violations. For example, some popular doorbell were recording a it motion at home and send the recording back to the cloud server in other country even if you did opt out for that in the app. Popular smart televisions were contacting Facebook, Netflix, Google and some advertisement trackers completely unexpectedly. Smart speakers were activating without saying the wake word, just saying for example I like Star Trek. We also noted that the cheapest devices transfer more information out and cost less. Could we measure economic value of privacy out of these differences? Would consumers in the future choose to trade privacy for price? With that, the smart speakers activated wrongly and therefore recording our conversation between two and 90 times per day. What we found is that most of the traffic is not going to the manufacturer, it's going somewhere else. That might be third party like trackers and advertisers. These devices are contacting destinations that are third party. Often the contract you set up with your provider allows them to traffic your data to other, other parties, but we don't check because um, terms and conditions are too vague, sometimes 40 pages long. This enables a privacy risk, especially as you don't know who those third parties might be. The main problem is, first of all, profiling. 
based on how the devices and the traffic from the devices. Third parties can create a unique profile for you. Preferences, user interests, it's easy to see what you like and how you can be, in a sense, influenced. So we will have a mass influencing. Think about the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, for example. The VoIC signal is a rich resource that discloses several possible states of a speaker, such as emotional state, stress levels, physical condition, age, gender, and personal traits. So manufacturers can build a very accurate profile of a user's demographic category, personal preferences, and this may also compromise privacy. When we talk about the future of these devices, we know that the Alexa as it is today won't be there. What happens when these devices become more like cognitive prospects? Playing a future influence in your life and helping you make decisions about the most intimate of subjects. But with accessing your data, the technology platform will learn your preferences, anticipate your needs and behavior, shop for you, monitor your health and help you problem solve in support of your mid and long term goals. Sounds great, doesn't it? But actually, in this future, we may see individuals using your data for the wrong reason. If you know most things about someone, it is easy to adjust and impact their behaviors from voting to shopping. Your data today might even impact your grandchildren's choices. With this Personable connecting to the devices, we can start seeing things such as work monitoring on sentiments. A place where there is a need for privacy protection, um, clocking your emotions and intent. Something my colleague, for example, Rania Alawi, is working on around emotional voice clocking for voice interfaces. A future of algorithm bias, identification and surveillance desires from states. What about making your own decisions? Do you want an opaque system like this? And um, who gets the data? I think there is a more positive future at play. One where we achieve transparency and privacy by default for the user. So they know what is going on and what devices are trustworthy. I will explain some future applications on which we are working on. We can't continue concealing and reducing responsibility for these organizations. We will only see more sensor embedded devices into our privacy, into our home, removing the constitutional sanctuary of the home. And we are seeing earbuds and other contexts adjusting devices playing a better role. In my vision, we will see the control back in the hands of the consumer. We will see um, and we will use similar devices and they will have a benefit. But we will have an awareness on when our information will be used negatively for abstracted purpose, such as restrict, restricting health insurance for your grandchildren, for example. We will go against immutability and look for technology to be temporal and at the edge, not at the cloud, but at the edge, at the our home. Easily deleting anything that is sensitive. These technologies have benefits for health and inclusion in society, helping people live better lives and giving good decisions, which we don't, don't feel forced to take. Society will change too, as we can create an improved uh, connection, understanding between people through emotion sharing and greater empathy. In the end, there will be a significant shift in the diversity of humanity as consumers exercise choice over argumentation. All devices used will be certified and trustworthy, where the manufacturers 
we'll have to declare the destinations the devices are contacting and the reason why they are contacting specific destinations, particularly third parties. There is already a direction, uh, a direction on that. They are called uh, Manufacturer User Description, MAP Profile, and it's a standard already. We will have third party certificatory and they will work as the certificates for the fridge works nowadays. For example, giving a mark, including security, privacy and uh, energy consumption. One of the critical steps that will enable this is solutions at the edge. And not only at home, but also on our inter-service provider. We need an automated framework for detecting and isolating non-critical communication from IoT devices. We call this Databox. In a way, Databox works like a firewall or an ad blocker for IoT devices that can be implemented at the home gateway. We start investigating this and we were able to block already 50% of destinations contacted by a camera without breaking the main functionality of the camera that is streaming the video. Databox will have user interface where users can decide and control their privacy. Control will be back to the user finally. We will see um, them integrate into the routers, which means that every device that connects to them updates the terms and condition accordingly. Block the destination um, they will offer the future, understanding if they are regulation compliant, for example. So in conclusion, it is not all bad, because those devices can help us to reach a more comfortable life, or can help people affected, for example, by dementia, to live better and for longer in their home homes. These devices will improve our ability to support people in their homes, and we can benefit from them but we need regulations and we need supporting tools for protecting uh, our privacy. So what's next? Here you have my links with my email and my details. I would ask you if you're working in industry within IoT and you want to change this, get in touch with me, let's start a conversation on how we can release this together. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. I will definitely make sure to be more conscious about my own practices uh, from smart devices in my home, especially as we don't really know where the information goes. Um, so we had a couple of, first, welcome back to the Q&A. And we had a couple of questions coming in from the audience, both beforehand, but also today. So I'll share one of the ones that came in from, from Slido before. So you have shared information on edge computing, data, data boxes, and emotional cloaking on voice. What might be other technological interventions that help us mitigate against privacy sharing IoT devices? Yeah, this is a very good question. So totally they uh, keep asking me this all the time. <laughs> um, there are some mitigation strategies. Um, from both a user and a manufacturer uh, perspective that can be adopted already. Um, some of them are really simple, like for example, using the mic off toggle or um, use other devices uh, that prevent smart speakers, for example, from uh, activating at all. Uh, this includes uh, a special bracelet that emits uh, ultrasonic frequency audio that interferes with smart speakers, uh, micro to prevent them from uh, detecting conversations. Um, another approach is to use, uh, for example, for Alexa, different wake word recognition. Um, from the point of view of the manufacturer, they can, uh, the companies can improve uh, the quality of voice recognition, uh, reduce the occurrence of mixed activations by hollowing different levels of wake word sensitive, for example, so that the users can decide uh, the trade-off between missing real activations and misactivation. So would you suggest to have a bit of a stranger wake word than Alexa then? So something that's harder to pronounce or... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are some solutions. Uh, Alexa, for example, in Hall of View to 
um, change away quartz, you can use a computer or echo. In our study, we demonstrated that the use the word uh, uh, echo instead of uh, Alexa or computer will uh, help uh, not to misunderstanding uh, the words and records when you don't want to. Um, but there are uh, also some other products, like there is a startup that, where you can put uh, this uh, hardware on top of Alexa and decide your own web words. Fantastic. So we had a question coming in from the audience asking, do you think devices can literally be components of our cognitive processes rather than merely supporting our cognitive processes? And does this make a difference to the ethics of the device? Exactly. So there is, there is no doubt that voice assistants or IoT devices in general are changing our lives. Um, they're offering companies and products to customers in a unique way. Um, there are some researchers that are trying to better understand consumer usage and perception of voice assistance of IoT devices. And um, a related question is whether such stimuli can identify um, a document and way it works or sound. Uh, the problem I think is that this technology is so new and came to our houses like an explosion recently uh, that it's not uh, still clear how much these devices are influencing uh, people's behavior and uh, how much they will influence people's behavior in the future. Uh, as I say in the talk, like uh, the, your data today can uh, influence the behavior or the choice of your uh, uh, children. Um, so there is a, a, an urgent need, um, first of all, to understand the behavior of this ecosystem and uh, then its impact on the consumers. Fantastic. And I think something that fits very well with this is the, the next question that has come in from the audience that is also around trust. So Sandy asks, why does the population seem to trust Amazon more than the government? I'm thinking about security services and backdoors. And then asks, finally, do you have any thoughts on the UK government's dropping of their track and trace up? So we can start with the first one first around do you have any yeah. idea why the population seems to trust Amazon more than the government? Yeah, this is a good question, actually. Uh, I think uh, trustworthiness is uh, like so, such a diff difficult concept. It's a dynamic, uh, time-varying uh, attribute, and the value of which may or may not uh, allow an entity to achieve a trust state at a given mo uh, moment motivates us um, to our, our group of research to define three base problem classes around the trustworthiness, um, trustworthy, trustworthiness problem. Mm. So we have a problem of trustworthiness on implementation. So um, this is so, so to, to answer directly the question, it's, it's not clear why. Um, we need uh, to develop three concepts. The first one is trustworthiness on implementation. So we need to understand the trustworthiness of agent upon its past implementation within an operational network or environment. So we need to understand the trustworthiness between machine paths. And then we need to understand trustworthiness through lifetime. Um, Trustworthiness is so difficult to, to measure. We need to, we need a tool and metrics for understanding uh, measurements tracking, modeling, and predicting the trustworthy agents in operation. Um, and we need to, to recognize that trustworthiness is dynamic. It can change uh, even, uh, even in uh, different countries. So something that is trustworthy, the, tr the definition of trustworthiness in Greece can be, can, cannot be the same um, perception of trustworthiness in the US. For example, so it's a good question, but it's 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 not clear what we need and what we are working on. in My group is um, developing tool for even uh, uh, measure trustworthiness. Mm. And I guess it goes back to some of the conversation that that Rafa had as well around culturally in different regions and markets, as you said, trustworthiness might mean, mean something completely different. So really understanding that kind of cross-cultural change as well. Um, there was another question that came in that asked, um, should every company offering products 
disclose detailed information on the use of consumer profiling and how the data is collected? Yeah, actually, this is a very good point, and it's already a reality, it's already there. In fact, the IETF uh, developed the manufacturer use of description standard, it's a standard already, uh, RFC 5280. And um, in my vision, so I think this uh, question came out uh, before I was describing uh, uh, data box or third party certified because that as well exactly this question. So not only a manufacturer will uh, share um, the math profile and will uh, share um, data on how they are contacting uh, parties and why, the kind of protocols they're using, but we, in my vision, in the future, we will have also uh, third-party certificatories. So data box, and, and data box, we also be able to talk with uh, other data box and learn uh, on a particular device, for example, we using uh, a crowdsourcing system, um, just to give you an example. But yeah, this is a great question. It's already there. It's, uh, uh, we, we are discussing this in the IETF it became a standard. The problem of the internet standards is that um, since uh, there are no regulations, uh, nobody will use it. So um, mad profile, that is like this manifest that devices us to advertise on the kind of destinations of things they're doing with the data. Um, it's there, it's a standard, but no uh, one of the 123 devices that we have in our lab are using it because it's not a regulation. So we have already this tool. Um, what we need is more regulations for making it real. Do you think it's also around creating consumer demand for these data boxes in the home that it's, it's about maybe creating the awareness? Yeah, exactly. So what usually uh, become, an, what usually uh, convert and need uh, so regulation is when uh, the, 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 the concern is that it's broadcast by people. Um, so if we create tools or metrics for uh, or advertising uh, what these devices uh, are doing with your data to, let's say, uh, non-engineering people, mm -hmm. maybe we will create like a sort of movement for, uh, um, that we follow from real regulations on that. Fantastic. And we have a question here that follows and more talks about the uh, um, company responsibility. So how do we ensure that companies don't hide the details of the data they are gathering in the complex terms and conditions? Is there work being done to make them declare those in a simpler way? Yeah, exactly. So we already saw that um, in some of our devices, like for example, the vacuum cleaner, um, we saw that uh, the answer we switched off uh, on the devices the, in like 20 seconds, the, 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 the map of your, the floor of the lab were in some server in the cloud. And we say, okay, we never, we, we actually never agree on that. And then we went to the terms and conditions that were something like 40 pages. So we, that we, nobody, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't read at the beginning. And uh, we saw that it actually was there. So it was, it, it was not clearly written that the, the device can share with third parties the map uh, of your floor. Um, and when they say third parties, they don't specify which company is the, 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 the partner. They say we have like third parties partner. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, we, we need to, uh, to actually make these terms and condition um, really clear, um, this is part of GDPR, but I think uh, uh, that GDPR is too generic. Uh, so it's legal because for GDPR, you have to declare that you are sharing uh, this personal information with third parties that they did. But mm. of course, nobody, I mean, no users will go through 40 pages of terms condition written in a small font, small font so it's something that needs to, to be clarified in the, in the current regulation, for sure.
And I, I guess that goes back to the kind of trustworthiness of the devices and displaying that in a much more clear and transparent way for the user as well. I think this will be the last question before we round up of the Q&A, which is quite interesting, which is what might be the leg legislative landscape for IoT in a post-pandemic Brexit Britain? Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, this is, this is a good question because this uh, pandemic took like uh, open question on how your data are sharing by your sickness. Um, so at Imperial, not, not particularly my team, but at Imperial uh, researchers are working on making this clear what are the guidelines for having uh, these uh, devices working and being completely transparent to the user. So there are some uh, requirements, for example, um, these uh, devices will help on uh, tracking uh, people that are sick, let's say, but the, the manufacturer doesn't have to know who is specifically that person. So we need, uh, there, there are specific tools for anonymizing the data and this has to be uh, used. There are also specific tools, not only for privacy, but also for security. So these devices have to have some specific uh, requirements in traffic. For example, traffic has to be encrypted. So no third parties so of malware can be applied to these devices. So I'm, I'm still going to sneak in the last question from Sandy before we go. So do you have any thoughts very short on the UK government's dropping of their track and trace app? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is something that it's not only UK, it's all around the world. Also in Italy, there is a lot of discussion on that. I, I think it's very useful to have an app like that. But as I said before, uh, we, we needed to follow up and be sure uh, that this kind of app are transparent to users. It means that the, like we saw, um, like I, I say for the IoT devices, these apps have to declare what they're sharing, when they're sharing, and each time they activate in background. Uh, the majority of problem for security and privacy in, of usage of the apps is that they can uh, uh, activate in background. So I think um, they have to be different and uh, they have to be clear and transparent to the users. It means that even in, when they activate in background for, uh, uh, let's say, um, state the location of the user, then they have to notify the user, something like this. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And audience, remember that Anna Marie and Rafa will join us for our final round table discussion where we'll discuss the future of these questions. So if you have something you really want to ask, please don't wait, but add your questions in the section now. What if our systems were fair to begin with? Our next speaker will share his research on the subject of justice, self-governance and AI. Professor Jeremy Pitt is the Professor of Intelligent and Self-Organizing Systems in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. He uses a combination of AI algorithms and deep social knowledge to develop socio-technical systems that address food security, air quality, energy poverty, and plastic reuse. He will share his insights from his work today through his pre-recorded talk, but we'll come back as our other speakers live later to discuss any questions you might have. Might have. It is now time for Pro Professor Jeremy Pitt's uh, recorded talk. So there are three essential words to this talk, rapid societal and transformation, because the message from world leaders and non-governmental organizations is clear. If we want to address existential threats like climate change, or if we want to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for peace, equality and social justice, then rapid societal transformation is necessary. But the message from sociologists, technologists and nerdy profs like me is equally clear. Advances in digital technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data and the Internet of Things, have changed the world at a scale and pace that is perhaps unparalleled in human history. So rapid societal transformation is possible. Therefore, applying some good old-fashioned AI logic to the two messages, we see that rapid societal transformation is necessary and rapid societal transformation is possible. But in order to align the two, we need to harness and steer these digital technologies in directions that we choose to ensure that the societal transformations that they will inevitably produce are indeed the societal transformations of the kind that we actually want. So to harness and steer a digital technology, we need to examine what artificial intelligence can do for us, which we do want, 
and then to examine what artificial intelligence can do to us and which we don't want. And this is the essence of the moral immoral dichotomy of design with artificial intelligence. Because algorithms and digital technologies, like all technology, are not inherently good or bad. It is only the uses to which they are put that have impacts and outcomes that can be judged good or bad. And these impacts can be unintended consequences, which is still no excuse for not trying to think things through. But the societal impact of technology can also be the product of design, and design is never neutral. And this is why, on the one hand, AI can be a positive force for pro-social good and can be designed to enhance qualitative human values such as sustainability and justice, and empower citizen participation and legitimate governance. But on the other hand, AI can have detrimental negative impacts and can be designed to commodify human values and undermine critical thinking, and can diminish the nature of humanity and even what it means to be human. So the biggest engineering challenge in bringing about societal transformation is to solve collective action situations in the context of wicked problems. Collective action uh, situation is one where a group of people need to make common cause in order to achieve a shared objective. Now, it would be more beneficial for the group as a whole if they cooperated, but due to conflicting or competing individual interests, they fail to do so. Now, a wicked problem is a societal problem whose complexity and continually changing requirements means there is not necessarily an obvious terminating condition. Sustainability is a good example. I don't recommend this, but you can jump out of a window and halfway down you can still be thinking it's okay so far. But this is the thing about sustainability. It can look okay until it isn't. Now nobody expected COBOL programs written in the 70s and 80s to still be running 30, 40, even 50 years later. But these programs are solving the same problem over and over again. They're immutable and monolithic and frankly a bit dumb. But in developing long-lasting systems to solve wicked problems, we need software which can adapt to different operating conditions and consist of many modular units which can be composed, decomposed and recomposed and demonstrate some degree of individual and collective intelligence. So that's our claim. I was aware of the proof of that. Well, we've frequently encountered issues of collective action and open-endedness when addressing the problem of resource allocation in computer networks and other distributed systems. So it turns out we were trying to solve a sustainable common pool resource management problem. Common pool resource management is a type of collective action problem where a number of independent actors have to share and make use of a common resource like a field for grazing or water for irrigation or energy from renewable resources. There are lots of questions here like <clears throat> how do you decide who gets how much? How do you stop somebody from taking too much? How do you stop someone from free riding by taking resources but not providing any? How do you do all this without some external authority or some centralised component telling all the others what to do? Now, I do know that Imperial College does have a bit of a reputation for preferring equations to people, so it might be considered a bit odd for someone who's been at Imperial for over 30 years to ask, how do people solve this sort of problem? OK, how do people solve this sort of problem? Well, if we look at the social science literature in the 1960s, there were two important theoretical results about common pool resource management. One said that people would not cooperate at scale unless there was some coercion. The other said that people would destroy a common pool resource by overuse in the short term, even if that was in no one's interest in the long term. And this was called the tragedy of the commons. However, in 1990, the extensive fieldwork of Ellen Ostrom, an American political and economic scientist, showed empirically that the tragedy of commons was not the inevitable outcome that was predicted theoretically. Turns out that human beings are great at making stuff up. Just when we make up stories, we also make up conventional rules. And we have to do this, otherwise we'd never play games. But it turns out we can also make up conventional rules to make sure that we can do sustainable common pool resource management. So, Ostrom inferred that sustainability of common pool resources was due to the formalisation of sets of conventional rules in what she called self-governing institutions. These specified constraints on people's behaviour that were mutually agreed, voluntarily monitored and collectively enforced. However, it is not just the institution per se that made the difference. The institutions had to exhibit eight distinctive features for successful sustainability, and this did not occur if one of the more of the features was missing. 
So Ostrom then went one step further and recommended that whenever faced with a CPR problem, instead of hoping to evolve an institution with the necessary features, you should design or supply an institution with those features already present. So she converted these features into what she called institutional design principles. And the key contribution of our work was to re-express these institutional design principles as code. And we could then implement communities or societies of intelligent autonomous software agents, which could execute these principles as code and could also sustain a common pool resource. But again, it turned out, provided all the rules were in place. We applied this in sensor networks where the sensors pool battery power, bandwidth, CPU time, and so on. And in cloud computing, where there is a trade-off between quality of service and total cost of ownership. The critical feature in both applications was self-organization. The agents themselves were deciding their conventional rules of resource allocation dynamically or on the fly by themselves. And this was so successful that for a while I started seeing everything as a collective action problem. And the only meta problem with that is if your only tool is an Ostrom shaped hammer, then every problem is a collective action shaped nail. But the meta solution is that by formalizing Ostrom's theories from the real world, to build intelligent systems for the digital world, it turned out we could use those intelligent systems to develop such solutions for the real world too. But then it turns out just because you can sustain a common pool resource doesn't necessarily mean that the distribution of those resources is fair. But then what exactly do you mean by fair? So if we look again at the social science literature, there are many theories and definitions of fairness, for example, proportional, equitable, envy-free, efficient, and so on. There are also many metrics for measuring fairness, such as the Gini index, and many confounding factors, such as the trade-off between cost and time. You can come up with the fairest solution in the universe, but it will not help if your algorithm is MP-complete, and that universe is going to terminate before your algorithm does. However, one time in the office of my friend and colleague, Professor Andrew Jones, who's an analytic philosopher from King's College in London, I found in his bookshelves a thin tome by the logician Nicholas Rescher. This book was simply entitled Distributive Justice. And in this book, Rescher observed that distributive justice has, throughout history, consisted in treating people wholly or primarily according to one of the seven canons, where a canon in this context is an established principle established in informal language. These seven canons of distributive justice were equality, need, ability, effort, productivity, social utility, and supply and demand. Rescher argued that each canon taken in isolation was inadequate as the sole dispensary of distributive justice. Instead, his position was that distributive justice was to be found in people standing with respect to legitimate claims, both positive and negative. And this, Rescher claimed, placed the emphasis for distributive justice onto three questions. Firstly, establishing what the legitimate claims are, what legitimate claims are relevant in a specific context. Secondly, working out how they are accommodated in case of plurality. And thirdly, working out how they can be reconciled in, in, cases, or in cases of conflict. So fair's fair, as they say, without, of course, ever saying what fair actually means. But we did then unto Rescher what we had done unto Ostrom and specified and implemented an algorithmic form of the theory. Now, with canons as code, we applied this to a group of agents who had to manage a common pool resource in an economy of scarcity with indivisible goods. So in an economy of scarcity, it means that there are not enough resources for everyone to get what they wanted. And with indivisible goods, you had to get everything you wanted or the fraction that you did get was worthless. And this means that in any one distribution of resources, it would not be fair and there was no metric for showing that it could be fair. But we showed that with agents that could self-organize according to Resch's theory, when you had a series of resource distributions computed one after the other, each of them could be separately unfair but it could be worked out to be fair over time. So now we have a system where we can change the rules to make it sustainable, where we can change values or the weight that we put on values to make it fair. But then we start running into well-known problems from legal and organisational theory, known as the paradox of self-amendment and the iron law of oligarchy. The paradox of self-amendment, as termed by the philosopher Peter Suber, says that if a rule has an amendment clause, can that clause be used to modify itself. So the rule says you can always change this rule, so does that mean you can change it to you can never change this rule? The second problem is this iron law of oligarchy 
as posed by the sociologist Robert Michels, which states that in any organisation, if insufficient attention is paid to the process and outcomes of self-mortification, then it will inevitably be taken over by a clique who will run it for their own interest and not in the common good. And this is what we call the dilemma of the rules. On the one hand, the rules have to be sufficiently unrestricted to allow freedom of collective action. And on the other hand, the rules have to be sufficiently restricted to resist the iron law of oligarchy and prevent the paradox of self-amendment. And this is a question of governance. So the West is the best, as we know, so the best system of governance is liberal democracy. And democracy is a bunch of Athenians doing one man, one vote in the agora, right? Wrong. So Professor Josiah Ober, who's a political scientist and classicist from Stanford University, tells a very different story. Ober showed how Athenian democracy massively outperformed its rival city-states economically, architecturally, militarily and diplomatically on a number of independent metrics, despite a relative parity in territorial size, population density, level of cultural development and availability of mineral resources. And Ober attributed the exceptional success of Athenian democracy to the greater social benefits derived from high levels of cooperation. And this was based on the Athenian superior capacity for resolving public collective action problems. And this was a product of special features of their participatory and deliberative model of self-governance. One of the most important of these special features was the distinctive Athenian system for organising useful knowledge for socially productive purposes. So of course, I tried formalising that Athenian system in an algorithmic framework for automating what's called interaction, interactional justice, showing how partial knowledge and subjective assessments can be aggregated into collective knowledge and an objective assessment. And this enabled a form of reflexivity. A system could reflect on its own performance and decide if self-modification of the rules is required or not. Moreover, Ober had another theory, a theory he called basic democracy as opposed to liberal democracy. And the essence of basic democracy was to work out how a group of people could self-organise themselves to avoid tyranny in all its various forms. To do this, he worked out and described a thought experiment called Demopolis. Now, Demopolis imagined a number of people with a preference for avoiding tyranny who were given an island or a city-state and asked how would they go about establishing a robust, long-lasting and legitimate form of democratic governance? Now, of course, a thought experiment, you can't really do that in practice, but you can approximate it with artificial intelligence. And this is what I did. I wrote a simulator for the thought experiment and showed how a group of intelligent agents could design and implement a basic democracy. And one of the conclusions that followed from this work was the idea of democracy by design. If you are designing a system that requires some form of governance, don't just build the system and try to bolt on the democracy afterwards. Design the system with democracy as a primary requirement. And this was known as democracy as code. Now, it also turns out that you can use the principles of democracy by design as an analytic tool. Unfortunately, I have to tell you this. If you look at the UK Parliament and system of governance, and wonder if it was designed according to the eight principles of democracy by design, you would think that the UK is a failing state. And then in terms of where we want to be in 2040, AI in particular, but digital technologies in general, have also been used to undermine collective action, to exacerbate social injustice, and to undermine effective knowledge management. And as I said, to diminish the idea of what it really means to be human. Because when we look at collective action, what do we see? We see the private ownership and control of the means of social coordination and peer production and digital innovation with little public oversight, little accountability and no transparency. And this has led to a global monopoly of just a few platforms, each of which dominates a sector of commerce and social life and also led to what we call the privatisation of invention. With respect to social justice, this monopoly has produced an asymmetric distribution of benefits and the rise of surveillance capitalism. This has led to a reduction in opportunities for successful collective action at scale, as well as opportunities for unscrupulous manipulation in pursuit of a hidden agenda, the concentration of political influence and intermediaries, who are often located beyond national governments, and the growth of unearned income by those same intermediaries. In terms of knowledge management, we see the domination of both information sources and communication channels, an unequal distribution of knowledge fostering distrust of reputable source and expertise, 
the elimination of diversity through polarization and fragmentation, and algorithmic reinforcement of confirmation bias through filter buzzle bubbles. And the way that humanity is changing, the, uh, we argue, it changes the way that we go about arguing, the way that we think, and the way that we hold each other accountable. For accountability, I've talked about DDoS, and this isn't an acronym in this context for distributed denial of service. It means deliberate denial of satire. Satire has been used proactively throughout human history as a means of mocking the pomposity and pretension of others, but it's being seriously undermined by deep fake videos, because if what is fake can be made to be seen as real, then what is real can simply be made to seem as fake and dismissed as such. When it comes to outsourcing cognitive and critical thinking skills, we are doing this all the time to voice activated virtual assistants. Draw your attention to the article by Jeff Robbins with the analogy of the jewel wasp, which injects its prey with dopamine while it lays an egg which hatches inside it. It doesn't have to be like this. Let's suppose you're aware of a burning issue of social injustice or climate change. For example, inequality in food distribution, how supermarkets and restaurants throw away unsold food, but some children, people in homeless shelters and women's refuges go hungry. Or we all buy stuff which is wrapped in single-use plastic, as much as uh, some of us try not to. And the result is that oceans are choking to death. Now you might think as a single person you can't make a difference. You might think that if there were enough of you, though, you could. You might wonder how you could get together, but for a myriad of reasons that we've just discussed, you don't want to use one of the big global platforms. And you don't want to really to wait around for someone to nudge you or to nudge enough of you to force you to act. But so suppose there was a platform that you could go from a software repository like GitHub, and you could download this platform, and this platform had eight specific features. It has openness, it's open source, it's non-profit, there's no advertising, and it's owned by a trust. It has uh, some form of codification. This platform is more like a multi-tool Swiss army knife. You can also download, configure, and install a range of additional tools called plugins. And these plugins used, are used to codify the deep social knowledge of Ostrom on sustainability, Rester on justice, and Ober on governance, and much more besides. It has generativity. You can customise your platform to look, feel, and work the way you want it to. And you can use a tool to build a tool that perhaps the designers of the original tool didn't anticipate or have in mind. There's some common pool resource things going on. There's a horde of programmers actually writing these plugins, working for fun and for the common good. And they're actually using their own instance of this platform to coordinate the production of these plugins. We have decentralization, so you can run your own platform. And it runs on a Raspberry Pi in your own home. So now you have your own server, so you can keep your own data and your own identity within your own boundaries. And you determine how much of this you want to reveal or release. You can have visualisation. Suddenly you can realise when you get your friends and your family and your colleagues to start working with you, you can see how each of your individual actions may not look like much on its own, but how the collection of small action contributes to a much larger action, which has a greater and more substantial effect that we can actually see. Then there's this notion of what I call park runification for those of you who like to run in parks. Somebody else sees your platform and they see the good that it is doing. And they think to themselves, well, I'll have some of that. And they can because something else you've done is that you've uploaded your customised version of the platform back to the repository. And these other people can download it from there. And you've performed a public good again because you've lowered the battery barriers to entry so that other people can get going quickly and easily. And finally, it's all transparent because all the protocols and programming interfaces are open and standard, you can belong to many different platforms but access them seamlessly all from the same app. And in the sum, there's an ecosystem. Anyone can link to your platform and so can many more. Before long, we have an ecosystem of these platforms. And then no one can own this because no one can buy the ecosystem. And this ecosystem of platforms can help us protect our own ecosystem, protect ourselves and protect our environment. So ultimately, this is the vision and this is the platform we're developing. It turns out there are many theories from the social sciences and those theories offer a deep repository of human knowledge 
What we're trying to do is turn that knowledge into logic and then turn that logic into code and turn that code into platforms that people can use for sustainability and social justice. Now, it turns out that the last wave of logic-based AI ended in the mid-1980s. The new wave of interest in AI and machine learning started around 2015. And the 30 years in between, well, that was my career. But one thing I've learned is that none of us can work in isolation, in isolation from each other or from the society in which we're embedded. And we have to take into account and take responsibility for the impact that our work and our algorithms may have on society. But then this is exactly how we will bring about the rapid societal transformations of the kind that we actually want. Thank you very much and do stay safe. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. It was extremely interesting to hear how you are using these, um, these rules from sociology and adding them to the world of artificial intelligence to encourage better living for the many. Um, so I have a couple of questions that have um, come in from um, beforehand from the audience. I think the first one is, these systems you're proposing are built on fairness and justice make a lot of sense. Why are they not built into current existing platforms? And what are the barriers? Um, well, it's nice that they make some sense. Um, I suppose one possible answer to that is that my parents named me after the gloomy prophet in the Bible. But uh, like many prophets, I'm just not going to be believed. Um, the more serious concern, perhaps, might be that um, one of the effects of uh, the design of the internet is that you get this concentration of monopolies at the application layer as a result of preferential attachment and, and that sort of thing. And that's actually created some very powerful economic interests. And of course, that actually some of the proposals that are in my talk are um, a bit subversive and actually challenging those very interests themselves. And another question is, um, as we're codifying these social values into AI, are we in a way also adding additional bias to them? You said that the Ostrom tools um, the, for the collective action problems did not work for all issues. So, so what is your thought there? Um, I think, if I understand the question right, we're, we're removing bias. Um, the, the Ostrom uh, principles uh, they, they needed to all be in place for the, um, the common pool resource to be sustained and if uh, some of them were missing, um, then uh, it wasn't possible to um, maintain the resource. It wasn't a, a product of bias. So, so I think actually getting everything in is removing bias, not, uh, not adding to it. Fantastic. And then Marcelo has asked a question here on what could be the impact of this technology in urban design? So what is your vision for that? Uh, so, so this is what we're trying to do with um, uh, smart cities, for example. Um, if I understand the question, uh, I'd like to think that it would be complementary to this kind of thing because uh, sometimes I see um, people designing smart cities and it's very much a, a technology first kind of thing. So oh, we can do this sort of technology mm. uh, and not so much actually thinking of this as uh, designing something that actually that people want to live and need to live together and how they can actually do that living together in some ways better. Uh, and so the kind of applications that we're, we're thinking of are, are all these sort of things which can um, provide these sort of benefits. So you mentioned some in the introduction, which was kind of you, but uh, working to uh, improve air quality, for example, without having to have a pandemic to, to make, it, make it happen, uh, to, to address issues of energy poverty and um, uh, food distribution, for example. Uh, and so these would all be uh, contributions to improving quality of urban life. So, if you, so what are the best ways that governments and organizations can take advantage of this knowledge that you created um, in, your, in your work? And how do you imagine it beyond what you said now with smart cities actually being used? Um, there's something quite deep, 
going on here because um, th there's a lot of factors that you have to take into account. So, so one of them, of course, is basic economics. There's a there's another thing about um, uh, education that has to be um, considered in terms of actually sort of making sure that people going through the education system are fully aware of uh, their responsibilities as citizens, but also what digital technologies can do to them. There's there's something quite lacking in terms of the checks and balances um, at quite a high level, because one of the things that we're seeing is is uh, the aggregation of sort of almost unearned economic power, uh, which is beyond state control. But at the same time, we're also seeing an aggregation of um, state power that is beyond citizen control mm. and so you have a significant problem when you have um, weak national governments which are not able to enforce uh, taxation in, in a in a strong and systematic way fantastic and i think we have another question that's coming so um, it's from Stephen who says, looking at the analogy between governance of societal systems and the more micro governance of largely unsupervised self-learning systems, could your methods inform how we delineate the parameters that the self-learning systems are allowed to learn and act within? And can the human intent behind defining this be codified into the structure? Uh, <clears throat> taking the first question, thanks very much for this question, Stephen. If, um, taking the first one, um, th there's something very interesting, something that we refer to as um, reflexive governance. So this is the idea that um, any system that has to, con any, any control system actually has to have a model of itself. Uh, and in particular, there are various different dimensions that um, that control of uh, social systems takes place across. Uh, and it defines a very, very large possible space. <coughs> and that it's a sort of space that is, there's not one solution. There's no silver bullet. It really depends on a lot of contextual factors. And the key thing is not to lose, um, get sucked into the, the poles of these dimensions um, and end up in a, in, in a, in a sink in, a, in the physical terms and not be able to get out of it. So, so the, the, the learning here is not just something that you want to do um, uh, in a deliberative stale, but stale state, but it's also a meta-deliberative one. So you have to deliberate about your deliberation and being able to understand the trajectories that you're on and where they can go and then you can do something about it. So, so that's how um, uh, uh, I, I could see uh, the algorithms for machine learning and self-learning here. And, and can the human intent behind defining this be codified into these? Um, my argument is yes. That's the whole point. That I think that we can actually codify this deep social knowledge in such a way that we can produce uh, systems which uh, allow. Uh, so I distinguish between self-governance and or algorithmic self-governance and algorithmic governance. So algorithmic governance being the idea that the machine determines a set of options and we, the users, are restricted to choosing between them. But algorithmic self-governance means that there's a um, assistance going on. You know, it's um, uh, a difference between a control technology and an assistive technology. Fantastic. I think we'll take one more question and then we'll move on to the round table. So I quite like Sandy's question here which is if you could reboot the whole internet would you uh, in the interest of time yes <laughs> <laughs> and how <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, with with some difficulty um, uh, I, I think it's very hard to put the uh, genie back in the bottle um, and this is one of the principles of in fact democracy by design you, you don't try to um, uh, reinvent something, you prevent it from uh, going wrong in the first place. So I think we have a, a, a lot of work 
to do. But for me, the, the, the ideal solution now would be for uh, scientists and technologists to, to work in conjunction with regulators to, to try to produce a um, backdated version of the internet and there's some simple things that we could do to start off with, but one of them would just be to ban advertising on the internet. I mean, you know, you, you take away the revenue stream, you take away the profit motive, which is the source of some of the problems that we're seeing. We had someone at Tech Foresight last year proposing to pay more for the internet, so we didn't have to have advertising. <laughs> it's uh, another solution. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, the thing is sorry, yeah, just a minute, but I mean, the thing is, it is a great public good and it was produced as a result of a collective action by a large number of, uh, of scientists and it can be a force for good. The problem is that we are seeing a lot of um, private enterprise built on top of a public infrastructure. Fantastic. I think that's a lovely end for the, for the Q&A. So it's now time for the roundtable discussion, and I want to welcome back uh, Raphael and Anna Maria for a very short uh, roundtable discussion. I actually think we had uh, one question here that I think really concerns both Rafa, Jeremy, and Anna Maria's work, which was let's wait for Rafa to get back on. So we received. But the on. video gives me an error message, Maria. When I try on, it says that you're not allowing me. Oh, there. Let's go. Oh, perfect. Great. Um, a denial of video at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think uh, Matthew's question is quite nice to start with, which was regarding well being measurements, as discussed by Raphael, are there benchmarking studies that compare levels of well being and the impact of emerging technologies? like AI from 10, 15 years ago with today's level of well-being. Would you like to uh, Yes, one? there is a World Well-Being Report that has been run uh, for at least 10 years, maybe a bit more. Um, and that will have questions about technology and so on. Of course, the effects are confounded with local changes in the different countries, right? Um, maybe the question goes into um, what is statistically the impact of technology on our well-being? Um, and I think that's very difficult to measure because we move society and technology move together so it's kind of related to what jeremy was saying uh, before uh, we our social values change the technologies and the technologies change our social values so it's very hard to to separate the two and, okay. and therefore the statistical measures uh, are very hard to produce but yes, there are, there are measures that have of well-being that have been used worldwide for over 10 years. Fantastic. And I, I think, Jeremy, you wanted to add something to that as well. Yes, thank you. Now, I agree with what uh, Raphael said. I don't personally know of any um, report or study that, that does this. Um, <clears throat> but I think it is quite clear that the, the levels of uh, mental health problem, especially amongst the, the youth, is um, increasing quite dramatically. And certainly some of the behavioral psychologists that I know uh, attribute quite a bit of that to um, the, the idea of um, uh, some form of dependence on their digital technology. And it's quite hard because it's, it's somewhere on the spectrum between uh, a habit and a, you know, an addiction. Mm -hmm. But there are clearly problems that are being caused um, especially amongst the young people today. Anna Maria, have you seen any in terms of the work that you've been you've been exploring around, especially IoT devices, which is an emerging technology that more people are using? Yeah, um, actually, in specifically for solve this problem, no. But uh, we are we are working on on that. So uh, it's clear that the technology will continue to drive your ship, consumer behavior, and uh, what we need. So we 
these de these devices are there for proposing to something, and what we need are uh, a specific tools for defend ourselves. Um, so they are not there yet, but we 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 are working on that. Fantastic. We got a really interesting question in now, um, which is if you would guide and teach a technology technological technologically illiterate person on technology and mainly privacy where would you start where would you focus on would that person need to know how to read code to be able to properly understand the data flow and its destination Anna Maria would you like to start on that yes <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, uh, so a person that's completely white in terms of uh, technical uh, details of internet protocols uh, nowadays won't be able to understand what is going on in uh, in uh, his home this is why we are working on this data box or this um, hardware that you can be put at the edge so in your home in, in a way that uh, the user uh, will have a completely transparent view of the internet traffic so the internet traffic that is now uh, um, like mm, sort of bits uh, stream will be translated in uh, something that is like um, GUI for mm -hmm. users. Um, so yeah, specifically now there is no there are no solutions for this, but uh, in the future we hope that we can give the right tools for users to do that. It's quite interesting because things are becoming almost more covert and hidden so the kind of exploring the the data flows would be quite interesting there rafa do you have anything to add to that at all uh, my um, issue sometimes with privacy or the way i see privacy uh, is that it's important as a way of keeping control of our own behaviors so it, where it becomes an essential right that we should all have is when the data is used uh, sometimes suspiciously to control our behaviors. Uh, so when it's used for us to um, buy more mm. or be, vote in a particular way. Uh, and this is done in ways that we don't understand that it's being, that it's advertisement. So privacy uh, nowadays has huge implications on the way we behave. No? Because when you sell people's data, uh, let's say your credit card data, transaction data to a company that will advertise, that will uh, influence your behaviors in ways that you didn't expect. No? It's very difficult, different to advertisement that is clearly advertisement. Mm. When you have a, ma a market of data, you don't know what they're using it for. So it's very hard sometimes to, for you to feel that you are um, behaving independently of, of what people are, you know, of these other pressures. So I, I think uh, you don't need to understand the technical aspects. You need to understand why privacy is important. And I think that's something that sometimes we can tell, we can feel. Now, when you go to a certain newspaper and you get advertisement for a search that you did last week, you can see the connection of how your data has been used to, to target you directly. And sometimes you, inside yourself, you feel, ooh, I've been manipulated, or that feels freaky. And sometimes we talk about it, no? like, um, I think that's something that we can all tell without being technologically savvy. Jeremy, do you have anything to add to that at all? Um, just briefly, um, it's a very good question. I mean, of course, um, where would you start? I wouldn't start from here is the um, usual thing. Um, but we've talked about the, the democratization of devices. Uh, so in particular, that the devices should actually work on behalf of the user, not the person that's selling it to you. Uh, certainly a democratization of data so that it shouldn't remain the preserve of political, scientific or, or corporate elites. Um, and actually what we've been proposing in the, the platform, of course, is that you know, all the data actually sits in there and you own that platform. 
Mm. Uh, and so then the, the issue of privacy doesn't come up except to the extent that it is negotiated by the people on that platform themselves to say this is what we're proposing to do and then you also um, have a much more symmetric um, balance between the benefits that you can get from the data and those that are benefiting from it. Fantastic. And I, I know we we are at 5 p.m. So I think if, if we're all fine to stay a couple of minutes to, to have one or two more questions. So um, I think this is a specific question that goes to you, Jeremy, here. So does your work apply to fundamental human values of anyone living anywhere in the world, or are they applicable to people in certain societies? For example, those who, who have inherited those Athenian values. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And of course, um, you just said we have to wrap up, so I can't give you a lecture on axiology right now, unfortunately. Um, but it's very interesting because it does seem that there are uh, some uh, values which are inherent across societies. And in actual fact, something that's really sort of bizarre is that uh, if you read the anthropological literature, there are some values that, especially well, actually some of the, fu the foundational stuff in the 20s and 30s, for example, that they study some of these um, um, uh, tribal societies and um, they refer to them as primitive or savage or whatever yeah. but actually they have means of organizing themselves which are really rich and deep in um, meaning and uh, maximizing spiritual well-being and actually these are things that we've kind of lost in um, uh, in quotes the west yeah um, you look at various ways that people are uh, communities have survived in harsh conditions and again they've got this wealth of knowledge you know, which actually we've, we've kind of lost and could do with recapturing. Fantastic so for the um, for the last question for this um, so we have seen that many in the news, many organizations like IBM that we discussed in the beginning are stopping their some parts of their facial recognition technologies. Do you imagine that this is just the, the start and what other technologies should have further scrutiny? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's a, I think that's a, it is, it's a, it is a great start. I think there are, there are, uh, I mentioned a, a, a list of them, but the one perhaps I didn't mention was um, uh, developments in um, uh, artificial smell, artificial noses. So uh, we called this uh, odor valence, actually. Uh, but it's, it's quite possible to identify somebody um, by their VOCs, their VOX, their volatile organic compounds that they emit. And actually, you can track people um, really quite closely if we could actually uh, identify that. So a more general thing, though, what I'd really quite like to see, and then picking up that point about scientists working with, uh, with regulators, it would be really nice to see something along the lines uh, um, of the WHO for medicine, uh, WTO, a World Technology Organization, which actually did this thing, and something along the lines of the um, Geneva Convention for Warfare, but uh, an equivalent convention for technology. Would that be connected to your approach to ethics, perhaps, Rafa? Mm. Uh, maybe. Um, I was trying to connect it to the issues of autonomy. But I will pass it on to Ana Maria, so I think it is more. Yeah, so uh, regarding uh, uh, facial uh, recognition, the main problem is that it's, um, as been demonstrated, the studies have shown that facial recognition technology is more likely to misidentify people uh, by your color of, for example, young people and women, leading to uh, them being uh, stopping incorrectly. This is why IBM decided to stop it and I'm glad, I'm glad they did. Um, there are um, 
other technologies uh, that I described in my talk that are already uh, doing same, leading to the same issue like voice recognition. It may lead to the same problems or create discrimination or try the companies try to understand the, um, your level of stress just by your voice. So we need uh, we also need regulation for that or tools that will help of hiding or anonymizing this, this data for fashion recognition or um, voice uh, recording. So yes, actually what uh, Maria was saying connected perfectly with what I was thinking. The, the issue with uh, computer vision and face recognition is that people cannot stop the surveillance. Mm. Uh, I think particularly those situations uh, will increasingly be strongly regulated to say the least. Uh, a mobile phone, see it's ringing constantly, <laughs> that's why I got distracted, but I can put it away. Mm. Um, if I'm wearing an Apple Watch or some sensor, I can take it off. Uh, if I'm wearing, um, you know, some kind of electronic digital clothing, I can take it off and go back to, to normal. But face recognition is something that I cannot stop. Voice systems is something that I cannot stop if they're put in the environment. I can decide not to put them inside the house, but I cannot stop them when I'm in a shopping center or when I'm in the airport. Um, and those are the things that we, um, because sometimes we need that space of privacy, especially, uh, and I think that's what triggered this situation with uh, facial recognition, is uh, uh, losing trust in the policing, in the government. Um, when that happens, companies pull back and mm. they say, well, I don't want to be involved in this because it's a PR disaster, it could be a, put it's a, a risk uh, that they are not willing to take. Um, and rightfully so, because they don't know how their technology will be used. I mean, people still remember when IBM sold technologies to the Nazis in the Second War. Uh, so they would not like to, that to happen again. Um, so, especially with technologies that cannot be stopped by the individual, I think that's where we have to be most careful. And that's where it's more likely we will have regulation and self-regulation. Fantastic, thank you so much. That's all we have time for. Um, thank you for staying a little bit longer, audience. Um, thank you, panel. Uh, it's been really interesting, and I guess it was like a quiet uh, negative <laughs> and to a quite positive future outlook. Um, but um, first of all, as I said, thank you so much um, to all the speakers who've been part of, of, the, um, of the session today, who've given us invaluable insights on how we might approach the question of moral machines and AI ethics.